Welcome to this segment, which is about converting equations. And we're converting in two directions. One, we're converting from, as you can see here, from rectangular to polar. And then I'm going to show you a few examples where we convert polar equations back to rectangular equations. And this segment's going to be different from, I think, maybe even any of my other recordings on the entire channel because I. I already created this video and then something happened. I don't, I don't remember how it happened or when it happened, but I ended up saving the second segment with the name of the third segment. Anyway, I had two files that were identical, but with different names. And what that meant, what that means is that I lost the third segment that I had recorded and I don't keep any of the original recordings because the files are too large. The only one that I keep is the one that I upload to YouTube. And that was the wrong file with the right name on it. So where am I going with this? The difference between this video and all the rest is I've already filled in the printable notes. So we're going to walk through and instead of using my pen and writing all this stuff out, sort of like a PowerPoint slide because it's already all there, I'm going to use my highlighter as we go through this segment worth of notes about converting equations from polar to rectangular and vice versa. And I'll just sort of highlight and talk about the process as I go along. My recommendation is, well, first I should point out that as we convert from rectangular to polar, we will use these two equations, x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. And then the second step in the process of making the conversion is we'll take the resulting equation and we'll solve it for r. So this equation, y equals 3, is pretty unassuming and not super difficult to work with. One of the two equations that we just looked at to facilitate the conversion said that y is equal to r cosine theta. x is equal to, no, x is equal to r cosine theta. y is equal to r sine theta. And so I've taken this y value here and replaced it with r sine theta. The right hand side of the equation hasn't changed at all. It's still equal to three. And now that I have this equation, I'm ready for the second step in the conversion process. I can divide both sides by sine theta in order to isolate the R value on the left hand side. And the result is our final answer, R equals three divided by sine theta. Not really exciting. We're happy to get the right answer, but yeah, okay, I made these made this substitution and solved for r. Pat yourself on the back, right? The equation y equals 3 on a regular Cartesian coordinate plane, you should know what that looks like. It's a horizontal line that passes through all of the points that have a y coordinate of 3. So a horizontal line that parallels the x-axis, but it's 3 units up. On a circular coordinate plane, like the polar plane, you'd think that it would be pretty difficult to graph a straight line. If you graph r equals 3, you get a circle with radius 3. So this, uh, the fact that this polar equation facilitates the drawing of the, ex or the graphing of the exact same horizontal line that's 3 units up from the pole Okay, that's kind of impressive. It's kind of cool that this equation draws a horizontal or straight and straight line on a circular coordinate plane. Now, I don't know what the graph of this thing looks like, but so here's my recommendation that going forward. I recommend that you just don't don't write any of this stuff down. You could write it down in advance, but hear me out. I think that you should just watch me talk through this so you can be paying attention to the video and I'll put my little highlighter marks on there. Watch through it and get a feel for do you think that you're going to want to leave any additional spaces in your notes? Do you think that um, you'll need uh, extra space for some little annotations or something like that? Just watch it through so you're not um, trying to watch and comprehend and copy it down all at the same time. Once you're done watching it through the first time, 
then write it down and maybe watch it at double speed. But well, whichever order you do it, um, I wouldn't be trying to write and listen at the same time because I'm going to be able to go a little bit faster here because I've already written all this stuff down. And so without further ado, let's continue. In this given equation, I'm going to replace x with r cosine theta and y with r sine theta. So there's the x and the r cosine theta, the y and the r sine theta. The 5 did also have to come down, and the equals 8 came along for the ride. So what I'm seeing in common, not in that entire equation, but on the left-hand side of this equation, is that both of those terms contain a factor of r. So I factored the r out and wrote it in front of this set of parentheses and left the remaining cosine theta and 5 sine theta inside the parentheses. So I, that's factoring out a GCF, the greatest common factor. Uh, you could think of it as reverse distributing if you want to. And remember that I'm doing all of this with my second step in mind, which is solving for r. Eventually, we need to isolate r on one side of the equation. Having performed that factoring, it makes it really easy for me to take this, uh, there we go, this left-hand side of the equation, and really the entire equation, divide the whole thing by cosine theta plus 5 sine theta, so that it cancels from the left-hand side and appears in the denominator on the right-hand side. And most importantly is that the r is isolated on the left-hand side. Now in the denominator of our final answer, you can see that I went back in blue and put parentheses in there. I did that because if you're typing this equation into a graphing calculator, depending on which calculator you're using, it might be necessary for you to put that expression in parentheses so that the calculator recognizes that the entirety of cosine theta plus 5 sine theta is meant to be in the denominator. Otherwise, the calculator could interpret it as r equals 8 divided by cosine theta plus 5 sine theta. And you don't want the calculator to read it like that, or your graph is going to be wrong, or it will output um, r values incorrectly or something. So make sure to put it in parentheses so you don't have that issue. So again, if you want to copy this down before I start talking, that's fine. Um, or if you want to wait and do it after, that is also up to you. But our original equation, you should know, is the equation of a circle on the Cartesian coordinate plane, the xy plane. And the x squared that's here, just above it, I wrote x. That's not the highlighter anymore. And I want to change the color of the highlighter. Let's try green. What this says is x minus h, in parentheses, squared. So that's the format for the equation of a circle, x minus h quantity squared, plus, I guess I could write this in also, y, so plus y minus k squared equals r squared. That's the sort of general version of the equation for a circle. Now, in this equation that's typed in in black here, the h value is 0. That's why it just says x squared. And the k value is actually a negative 3. So that says y minus minus 3. Your r value is therefore also a 3, because 3 squared would give you a 9. And what all of that means is the center of the circle, which is located at h comma k, is therefore, for this uh, particular circle, located at 0, comma, negative 3. The radius of the circle is 3. So if you wanted to draw yourself a little graph, you could, just by knowing what the uh, rectangular equation would look like if you graphed it. Now, same idea. I'm replacing x with r cosine theta. I'm replacing y with r sine theta. There they are. The plus 3 still has to come down, so you're seeing r sine theta plus 3. All of that has to go in parentheses and be squared, which means we have the pleasure of foiling it and combining like terms. 
uh, in the next line. But first, let's look at this part just to make sure we're all on the same page. R cosine theta is the same thing as R times cosine theta. When you square that expression, that means R times cosine theta times R times cosine theta, it's all multiplication, so you can shuffle it around and you get the R times R makes the R squared that you see on the next line. The cosine times cosine gives you the cosine squared. Then we need to come in and take this expression, which is in parentheses, and we need to square it. If you write it out as R sine theta plus three times R sine theta plus three, you go through the foiling process, then combine like terms, you're going to get this expression. Now, interesting that that one ends up ending with a nine, and it's actually very helpful because when we subtract nine from either side of that equation, they're gonna disappear and we get a zero on the right-hand side. So that's why I wrote down minus nine here. I subtracted nine from both sides. The other thing that I'm going to do to that equation is I'm going to factor. What am I going to be factoring? I'm looking at these first two terms here. They both contain a factor of r squared. So I'm factoring that out front. That's the GCF that's appearing here. The leftovers are the cosine theta, the plus sign, and the sine theta. Those have to stay in parentheses so that if I distributed the multiplication by r squared, it would take me from that line back up to the previous one. And you could check that out. That would work. I didn't do any factoring of the 6r sine theta. That's staying just as it is. So there it is. And what that's allowed us to do, uh, hopefully you're recognizing it, is notice that what ended up inside parentheses is one side of the trigonometric Pythagorean identity. So that expression, which I underlined in blue originally, is equal to one. So r squared times one is equal to r squared. You can see the r squared here. The 6r sine theta on the previous line came down to the current line. All that's equal to zero. And then the next thing I did to this equation is I factored. And what I factored is from this term and this term, they each contain a common factor of r. So I factored that out and you're seeing it here. And then here are, as I call them, the leftovers, still inside parentheses. Now the zero product property says that if we have something times something else and the result is zero, the only ways that that can happen is if either the first thing, the first factor is equal to zero, or if the second factor is equal to zero. Now if the first factor here is equal to zero, that means r is equal to zero. And the graph of r equals zero is a point at the origin. That's incorrect, and I know that it's incorrect because I took the time to think about what the original uh, rectangular equation represented, which was a circle with radius of three centered at zero comma negative three. That's not a point at the origin, so the resulting polar equation, it would be incorrect for it to yield simply a point at the pole. So let's look at the other uh, factor involved in this equation, which is the r plus 6 sine theta. If we take that and set it equal to 0, and we subtract 6 sine theta from both sides, we get this equation, which I've put a box around as my final answer, r equals negative 6 sine theta. If you were to graph that, and the way that we think about it when we graph an equation like that on the polar plane is the 6 represents the diameter of the circle. The fact that it's a sine theta means that the circle is either going to be sitting above the pole or uh, residing below the pole. And the negative tells me that it's sitting below the pole. So that's why we have a circle with radius three that's just barely touching the pole up at the top of the circle. And that is the same graph that we would get if we graphed the original rectangular equation 
on the XY coordinate plane. Uh, what are the tricky parts about this problem? Making the substitution shouldn't be too difficult. Making sure to use parentheses here and here and here and here after you make your substitution or while you're making your substitution, that's very important because it causes you to do the next step, which was expanding and actually squaring those things, uh, squaring the first term, foiling and combining like terms on that second uh, expression that's being squared. From there, you need to train your eye to look for the factoring that needs to be done, seeing those R squareds that were there, knowing to take that out, especially since the result was the Pythagorean identity, which turns into a one. Uh, subtracting the nines, I don't think is a, a big stretch. I think you might intuitively think to do that, but uh, factoring out those R squareds, you need to train your eye to look for that. Hi, Sophie, I hear you. Uh-huh, everybody hears you. And then in the next equation, looking to factor again, it's just something that you need to train your eye to do, uh, train your mind to consider as an option for a next step. Remember that you can always do that factoring and end up with an equation where you decide, I don't really think I should have factored. Um, and that's okay, you just put a line through it or erase that line and, and take a step back and try taking a, a different approach from there. And then don't forget the zero product property where we set each of those factors equal to zero. On, that was page six of eight, so we're making good progress. We're going to shift now to looking at the conversion from polar to rectangular equations. And that process requires the use of not all four of these at the same time, but you need to be mindful of these four. And if you're using a formula sheet, you should look at that formula sheet and see if these four equations are on that formula sheet. If they're not already on that sheet, that means you need to commit these equations to memory. In order to write this r equals 10 equation in or as a rectangular equation, we need to replace the r with something that has to do with x's and y's. And thankfully, we can see that the third of those equations at the top of the screen the third of those equations uh, says x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So what I did to the given equation, r equals 10, is I squared both sides of it. That gave me r squared equals 100, but the most important part is that it gave me the r squared. That way I can take the r squared and replace it with x squared plus y squared, which is exactly what I did. There's our x squared plus y squared on the left-hand side. The 100 is still on the right-hand side. And this is a circle. It's a circle centered at zero, zero, because our h and k values are both zero. And the radius is r squared, which is the, uh, r squared equals 100. The radius is just r. So if we square root 100, we get 10. So it's a circle centered at the origin with a radius of 10, which the polar equation, r equals 10, would yield the same graph, a circle with r equals 10, radius equals 10. Now for this unusual equation, theta equals pi over three, this is a little bit different because we're not going to replace theta with something. We're actually gonna take theta equaling pi over three and plug that theta value into one of these four equations. If we plugged theta equals pi over three into here, that would be fine, but we'd still be left with this r value. And ultimately in a rectangular equation, we don't wanna have an r value. Same problem in the second equation, we'd still have that r value hanging around. The third equation doesn't have an opportunity to plug theta in, but if we plug theta into the fourth equation and take the tan of pi over three it will equal y over x, and we will have an equation that does not contain any r's or thetas. It will only contain x's and y's, which means we will have successfully made the conversion from polar to rectangular. 
So let's take theta equals pi over three and plug it in to this tangent equation. I rewrote that fourth equation, tan theta equals y over x. Here I've substituted pi over three in place of theta. Then I took the tangent of pi over three, which is equal to the square root of three over one. In other words, the square root of three. And then I solved this equation for y. I wanted to create a y equals equation. I made that happen by multiplying both sides of the equation by x so that the denominator of x disappeared from the right hand side, leaving me with just the y. The x appeared on the left hand side and there is root three x. If you graph that rectangular equation, you get this sort of diagonal line that passes through the origin with a fairly steep slope of approximately 1.7, which is the square root of three. <clears throat> and if you were to graph this polar equation, you would have a diagonal line also going right through the pole, except it would, the, I mean, the line would look identical, right? It, the graph would still look like this, but since you're on the polar plane, think of it as a diagonal line that's aiming in the direction of the theta value, pi over three. Interesting to see the polar equation and the rectangular equation still yielding the same graphs. All right, we're on our last page here. Just a few more equations I wanna look at with you. R equals six secant theta. So a little additional work that we needed to do converting secant or writing it as one over cosine. This one's quite tricky because we're trying to replace, remember r's and thetas, we're trying to replace those with x's and y's. And if we can associate this cosine theta with this r value, then we'll have an r cosine theta and r cosine theta, which is equal to x, we can make that substitution. So from this equation, I multiplied both sides of that equation by cosine theta. So the cosine disappeared from the right-hand side. It appeared on the left-hand side with the r. We've got r cosine theta equals six. Then I made my substitution because r cosine theta is equal to x. That was one of the equations we saw at the beginning of this segment. So I replaced it with x and we've got our rectangular equation, x equals six, which is a vertical line passing through all the points that have an x-coordinate of six. Again, to graph a straight line on a circular coordinate plane, nice to know that that's even possible. In our next equation, this is maybe the one that requires the most creativity to think to do this. What I did is I took this equation and I multiplied the entire thing by r. So we get an r value multiplied into here, an r value multiplied in, I chose to write it, write it between the eight and the cosine, an r value multiplied into here, I wrote it between the two and the sine theta. The result is this equation, r squared equals eight r cosine theta plus two r sine theta. As we know from glancing back to the original four equations that we're using as tools to make these conversions from polar to rectangular, we know that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. So I've made that conversion or substitution here. We know that r cosine theta is equal to x. So we're seeing that that's happened there. r sine theta is equal to y. So I made that substitution back there. And we end up with this equation which is rectangular because it only has x's and y's in it, but it's not in a very familiar format. So what I've done is I've gone through the motions to complete the square. And as you can see at the bottom of the screen, the result is the equation of a circle. In order to complete the square, I subtracted 8x and subtracted 2y from both sides of the equation so that everything appears on the left-hand side of the equation and only a zero appears on the right-hand side. I also left these additional spaces here because I knew I was setting up to complete the square. 
On the left-hand side of the equation, I've grouped my x terms together and my y terms together, leaving a little space after each of those pairs of terms because I need room to write an additional value in there. And what is going to be that additional value that appears here and here? Well, they're different values in this case, but in order to find them, I take my b value, or my middle coefficient here, I take that number, and I divide it by 2. This actually says 2 right here. Negative 8 divided by 2 is negative 4. And then I take that negative 4 and I square it, and I get 16. So that 16 is going to get added into this space. To complete the square on my y terms, I'm taking the negative 2, bringing it down here, dividing it by 2. You always divide it by 2, by the way. And then square that value. So negative 2 divided by 2 is negative 1. Negative 1 squared is positive 1, so the positive 1 is going to get added in to this space. Now don't forget that whatever you do to the left-hand side of the equation, you must also do to the right-hand side. So while I did add the 16 in here and the positive 1 in here, I also have to add them to the right-hand side of the equation. So you're seeing them there, the 16s and the 1s that I just circled. That's great. Now, I've under bracketed here because I'm going to take those three terms and I'm going to factor them. And I know what the result of that factoring process is going to be because I designed it to turn out to be x minus 4 squared. This 16 is a key ingredient in being able to factor that expression and have the result be x minus 4 squared. Similar situation here. The plus 1 allowed me to factor this and turn it into a y minus 1 squared. If you need to do some review on factoring, I recommend looking up factoring a perfect square trinomial. That's also the reverse process of foiling and combining like terms on the y minus 1. Uh, you could also look up the process of completing the square. You'll see additional examples of that process um, sort of tangled up in, in that process. On the right-hand side, we've got an unfortunate 17. It's okay. We can just leave it sitting there. Remember, though, that the formula or sort of general format for the equation of a circle is x minus h squared plus y minus k quantity squared equals r squared. So here you can see pretty clearly that the h is a positive 4, the k is actually a positive 1. It looks like a negative 4 and a negative 1 if you just look at the equation in blue. But when you match it up with the, what I've written in red, you can see that the h value and k value for this particular equation are actually both positive. So I've written that the circle has a center of positive 4 comma positive 1. And don't forget that the radius is equal to the square root of that constant value that's on the right-hand side. And I'm pretty sure that that is it. All right, I think that concludes our exploration, at least for this particular section. That's the last segment in this section uh, of our initial exploration of the polar plane and some graphing and the... Uh, equations that are going to be resulting in some of these graphs. In the next section, we're going to go ballistic with the graphs. So please click on the link that is just below me here, uh, sort of left center on your screen, and follow me over to the next section where we keep talking about the polar plane and we get really detailed in our exploration of some of the other graphs that you might see. I'll see you there. Thanks.